Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. This is, so Dar I was saying to a few people that Dartmouth is halfway between my um, real hometown, which is Montreal, and my adoptive hometown, which is Boston, because I did my PhD in Boston, so this is a good uh, halfway point. Okay, so hydropower um, accounts for the majority of installed capacity uh, of renewable energies in general worldwide. Um, because we can control the water level in the large reservoirs that are constructed behind the dams, we can easily toggle supply of electricity to meet demand. Um, and so hydropower, unlike wind and solar and some other renewables, doesn't have the same um, intermittency issues. And so it's one of the only renewables that can contribute to uh, baseload supply. And so hydro is a very attractive um, energy source worldwide. Um, and uh, forecasts suggest that um, installed capacity might increase by 50% worldwide um, in the next 30 or 50 years. Unfortunately, hydro has been plagued by environmental impacts. Um, last week, for instance, the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner instructed Canada to desist from construction of the Site C dam in British Columbia uh, over failure to engage um, indigenous, local indigenous stakeholders um, with uh, negotiations over environmental impacts. Brazil, Canada, and other countries uh, all have a very long history of conflict with indigenous groups uh, over uh, real and potential impacts to water and food systems. Um, and so this raises a food energy water trilemma, which is how do we expand this promising a uh, source of renewable energy while safeguarding uh, water resources and food systems that um, in the context of hydro and in the context of Canada and Brazil at least, um, predominantly affect indigenous populations. So there are a few environmental and engineering management uh, issues with the way uh, environmental impact assessments are done in the setting of hydropower. Um, First, assessments are, tend to be done after um, a lot of resources have been sunk into the design and siting of hydro projects. So because all of this work has been done up front and the environmental assessments are done after, there's an incentive to downplay risks. Second, um, environmental, health, social um, impact assessments are all done by different groups of people. And these groups of people are not the same ones doing the design work. So there is really limited uh, potential to use any results from environmental or um, health impact assessments um, to guide design decisions, uh, either design of a site that's already been chosen or in picking sites for development. And uh, I'm also going to argue in this talk that the fact that environmental health and social assessments are done by different groups of people at all is problematic because it prevents you from seeing uh, a sort of synthetic picture of risk. Um, and I, one of the main themes in my talk today is going to be that um, looking at these problems together reveals features of the system that will help you make better decisions. Um, and so I'm going to hammer on that theme a little bit in the next little while. OK, so my research um, in the setting of hydro uh, or in, actually my research in general, has been devoted to developing tools to anticipate environmental and human health impacts, um, leveraging all data and all latest scientific understanding of the diverse systems um, spanning environment and human health. And in the setting of hydro, I've applied that to uh, a chunk of the problem that revolves around methylmercury. Um, and so today I'm going to start by introducing some basic science about methylmercury and hydroelectric reservoirs. Uh, I'm going to pivot then to um, methods that we've been developing to forecast risks and inform decisions about hydro design and risk mitigation. And I'm going to wrap up uh, with some ideas for future directions and a Q&A. <coughs> okay, so... Um, we were just discussing mercury is uh, emitted from both uh, natural and anthropogenic uh, sources. It participates in a complex uh, atmospheric global uh, transport system. So mercury is emitted and it's redeposited worldwide. So even in the pristine environments 
that are far from industrial uh, developments that tend to be electric projects. Um, this soil still has a relatively large reservoir of inorganic mercury. Soil also, of course, uh, has a large reservoir of carbon. And so when you flood a reservoir, you create uh, anoxic environments um, under the water surface that promote the proliferation of anaerobic bacteria. Um, some of these bacteria produce methylmercury out of inorganic mercury. So they add a, um, a methyl group to the carbon, sorry, methyl group to the mercury um, as a byproduct of their cellular respiration. And so this turns uh, inorganic mercury into methylmercury in flooded reservoirs. We care about methylmercury in particular because it's the, uh, it, on the one hand, it biomagnifies. So even though it's uh, present only in extremely trace amounts in natural environments, the concentrations in the food chain are so much higher um, than in the ambient water column that um, it poses, it can pose serious problems to human health. So for instance, in phytoplankton, you have concentrations um, maybe 10,000 times the water column. And then by the time you get to the top of the food chain, so piscivorous fish or fish that eat other fish, um, you have a million or 10 million times uh, enrichment relative to the water column. <clears throat> the issue of methylmercury in fish was first identified in the 1950s in Minamata, Japan. Um, a lot of you might already have heard of Minamata, Minamata disease. Um, one of the recent mercury conventions is called the Minamata Convention in honor of this. Um, so they basically, uh, epidemiologists at that time linked uh, occurrence of death, severe birth defects, um, severe neurological abnormalities with, very high, with ingestion of uh, fish that had very high levels of methylmercury. Um, and that was in the 50s, and since that time, uh, epidemiology has linked lower and lower levels of methylmercury exposures to more and more subtle um, uh, neurological and cardiovascular risks. And now the current scientific understanding is that um, any marginal increase in methylmercury exposure, all else being equal, will increase your risk uh, of neurological risks, especially for prenatal exposures. So. Um, maternal exposures to um, marginally higher methylmercury levels will place the developing fetus at higher later in life risk of uh, IQ deficits and ADHD and other very subtle neuro uh, neurodevelopmental endpoints. Now, the link between hydropower and methylmercury production has been known in principle for many years. Um, so, for instance, this plot shows the time course of mercury in whitefish in three different reservoirs in Quebec. Um, you can see that, generally speaking, um, levels peak within the first five to 10 years and decline, decline to levels, you can't really see it, but this is roughly baseline levels over the next three or so decades. Um, and even though there's been a lot of research over the past several decades into the uh, mechanisms that control environmental production and degradation of methylmercury, a lot of it done here at Dartmouth by Celia Chen and colleagues. Um, we haven't until recently had good tools to, uh, on the scale of large sites, uh, predict what the magnitude of this pulse will be, um, what factors might change that on the scale of ecosystems, um, and it's been very hard to disentangle on the level of human exposures what the role is for hydropower um, uh, compared to other sources. So for instance, um, in the 70s and 80s when this, when the maybe early 70s, I would say, um, when this issue was sort of becoming more or better known, um, it was observed that indigenous populations near hydroelectric reservoirs had uh, very high methylmercury exposures. It was also known that indigenous populations in general tended to have higher methylmercury exposures because they eat a lot of fish. And so it's been very hard to disentangle the role of hydro um, from overall exposures, um, and then to figure out um, what we should do about uh, 
hydroelectric design and what we should do, what should be our risk mitigation message. So what should public health people tell people who are possibly impacted by this issue to do um, to minimize their public health risks, um, considering that local foods and seafood in general is very nutritious. So I kind of see um, the traditional approach to this problem as, well, we pick a site to develop for whatever you know, reasons, um, economic and other reasons. We do the project, we monitor fish mercury, and if the fish mercury gets too high, we issue food advisories and tell people not to eat the fish. And this is becoming increasingly unsustainable as indigenous populations are increasingly asserting their right to be informed of risks uh, ahead of time before the impacts occur. Um, and it's also just not a responsible way to manage the environment. Um, and so I have been developing tools that will hopefully allow us to predict impacts on mercury production in the environment, predict what those impacts will be on human populations, um, and then compare those uh, outcomes across uh, alternative policies or alternative design um, scenarios so that we can make uh, overall better decisions. And doing this, of course, in consultation with um, all stakeholders. So we got um, involved in this project in the context of Muskrat Falls, which is a hydroelectric project on the Churchill River in Labrador um, at the top. I can't reach that, but you can see where the top arrow is pointing. Um, so the plan was to develop Muskrat Falls to replace an aging uh, coal-fired power plant in Newfoundland. Um, and then to sell the excess power down through the Maritimes um, into the US export market. Um, and it is meant to have an installed capacity of 824 megawatts, which is at least 500,000 homes, depending on what assumptions you make. Um, this is Muskrat Falls. Uh, it no longer exists. The river has already been rerouted in anticipation of reservoir creation. <coughs> so. Uh, Muskrat Falls is about 50 kilometers upstream from the first of three Inuit communities settled around Lake Melville, which is actually, it's called Lake Melville, it's actually a fjord um, that drains the Churchill River to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and when the project was sanctioned, the local Inuit were understandably concerned about the risks for methylmercury impacts. Um, they had known about the experience, for instance, of the Quebec Cree and of populations in Brazil and they um, basically wanted to know what the risks were. They weren't involved really in the project development um, phase. Their consultation was not, didn't really occur because they were considered to be downstream of environmental impacts. <clears throat> and the added wrinkle in this case, I'll go, so I'll go back to that slide to illustrate this. The added wrinkle in the case of the Labrador Inuit is that um, they're settled downstream and at the time, uh, that this project was sanctioned, there wasn't any environmental data um, or any real scientific understanding for how methylmercury inputs from a freshwater environment, so from this river, would impact a downstream estuary. Um, it was optimistically hypothesized by the utility that the dilution in the estuary would be such that there would be no impacts. And so the lack of... Um, lack of scientific understanding, the lack of forecasting tools um, gave the utility, I guess, a lot of latitude to claim that there would be no environmental impacts whatsoever. So for instance, the initial uh, uh, impact assessment in 2009 said there's no reasonable possibility that the project would have an adverse environmental effect on the Labrador Inuit settlement area. Um, and then as recently as 2016, the executive vice president was still claiming that there will be no impacts. Um, and so this uh, obviously caused some amount of concern, um, especially because they had been excluded from the environmental impact assessment zone. So they excluded them because there are gonna be no impacts, but how do you know if they're gonna be no impacts if they're not in the zone? So that, you know, the science is a little bit complicated, but that reasoning was not hard to pick apart. And so this caused a lot of unrest in the community people were protesting. Um, and basically our uh, research group got involved in this because it raised some interesting scientific questions. <coughs> and the work that I'm gonna be describing um, 
in a few slides, actually grew out of uh, work led by Amina Shardup, who's now a AAAS fellow and who was a postdoc at Harvard when I was a PhD student. And her work uh, aimed to characterize the main mechanisms that control mercury cycling in a, down, in a northern, highly stratified estuary and to figure out the environmental mechanisms that uh, would mediate uptake into the downstream food web of uh, methylmercury input from the Churchill River. And so between 2012 and 2015, we were on the field um, collecting samples and building a computational model to uh, figure out baseline cycling of, of methylmercury um, in anticipation of doing work to forecast uh, impacts on the downstream environment. And so that work actually found that um, the very high stratification in northern estuaries creates a thin layer that concentrates freshwater inputs. And because the thin layer at the t top is where the base of the food chain hangs out, primarily phytoplankton and stuff, it concentrates the methylmercury inputs into this top layer and promotes impacts or promotes bioaccumulation in the downstream environment, which is likely then to propagate upwards into uh, subsequent trophic le levels. And that sort of created a mechanism by which we would expect to see downstream impacts um, in northern environments in general. And you can see, so my contribution to this work was mainly developing the uh, framework for simulation that would allow us to predict how perturbations in the upstream system um, would affect uh, downstream levels. You can see I'm not, I don't know if you can see this picture, but I'm not very helpful on the field. This is, <laughs> I think I'm holding a Tim Hortons cup in that, in that picture. Um, so we're gonna pivot now to work that I've primarily been responsible for, which has been uh, the development of predictive tools to figure out what the impacts are um, of uh, hydro interventions on the environment and on human health. Um, and the proximate goal for this work was uh, to figure out the risks for this population around Lake Melville, um, because that was the sort of immediate setting that we were working in. The overall goal is to create a generalizable tool um, for methylmercury impacts of hydro in general. And so for the next few slides, I'm probably gonna get into some nuts and bolts about how the uh, modeling works for Muskrat Falls and the Labrador Inuit. Um, in, in particular, but I'm going to reemphasize that it's going to come back together in a more generalizable way. So when reservoirs are developed, virtually all of the methylmercury is produced in the flooded soils. And in most environments, previously unflooded environments, um, there are some exceptions like wetlands. Uh, organic carbon is thought to be the limiting factor in the production of methylmercury. And I found that across a wide variety of environments, um, across several countries, um, you could figure out, just based on a simple linear regression, what the maximum post-flooding methylmercury concentration in the soil would be as a function of soil organic carbon, and use that as a starting point, sort of, if you imagine it mechanistically, this is where it all starts. Um, to forecast what the levels would be after flooding in the soil. And there are global data sets for uh, organic carbon um, from satellite imagery and otherwise. Uh, but in this case, we also had site measurements that matched pretty well. So that's sort of where it all starts. Um, and then without getting into all of the modeling details, the fade and transport modeling, we could use that to drive a bigger model so we have forecasted methylmercury in the soil using um, environmental data and that we, some we measured, some are from global data sets. Um, we could figure out how that methylmercury partitions into the dissolved phase, how the dissolved phase uh, diffuses across the sediment water interface, how that degrades in the downstream environment. Um, and then in the setting of uh, Lake Melville in particular, we can plug that into the budget that we established for the downstream estuary. Um, most environments uh, in which this, uh, that face this problem um, are not as complex as the one that we studied in 
that we studied here, um, most uh, people are, are impacted by fish from the actual reservoir. So um, to make this more generalizable, we would typically only consider you know, the first two steps. Um, we wouldn't have to consider these other dynamics. So this is another point I wanted to mention briefly, that <clears throat> this represents everything very kind of deterministically. Um, but the actual modeling framework was probabilistic. So we considered um, deterministic equations to model the physical environment, but all the parameter values um, are probabilistically distributed. And so this gives us a probability distribution about potential future states for the downstream environment. So here we have, OK, we have the downstream river stem on the top and Lake Melville, the estuary at the bottom and measured baseline merc methylmercury levels on the x-axis measured here. And the y-axis corresponds to the probability density for the forecast, which is in blue. So basically, for the river, we think we're going to go from here, which we measured at baseline, to somewhere in this blue region, depending on what physical reality actually manifests itself. Um, some of the model is very sensitive to certain um, parameter values like partition coefficient. So the, for instance, um, the more methylmercury partitions to the, uh, to the flooded soils, the less is available to diffuse across the sediment water interface. And that would tend to bring you to the lower end of this distribution. Um, so the other feature that you can see here is that obviously the impacts are forecasted to be much greater on um, the downstream river. Uh, partially because it's closer than the estuary, so there's less photodemethylation, which is a main loss term. And there's also uh, more dilution in the downstream estuary. So even though there is that thin layer that concentrates uh, methylmercury into the downstream food web, there is still a lot of loss from um, mixing. <clears throat> and in order to understand how those changes uh, in the water column are likely to impact human health. We enrolled over 1,000 Inuit into a dietary survey um, where we basically asked, uh, you know, in a few dozen questions, um, what do you eat, how much of it do you eat, um, and where do you get it? And for key species with no available baseline mercury data, we did the measurements ourselves. So that's one of our RAs, Harry, in the lab dissecting a capelin or something. Um, and for other species where we had good mercury data at baseline, um, we just used that data. And then from participant reports of uh, their diet from the local environment and this data about mercury and fish, we were able to estimate their baseline exposures. Now, anyone who's done surveys with recall data knows about the horrible potential biases and over-reports and under-reports and all of that. So for a subset of participants, we collected hair samples. And we measured mercury in the hair samples <coughs> and compared the measured mercury in the hair samples to what we would expect to see from if we believed their uh, dietary survey. So basically, by multiplying grams per day by nanograms per gram, um, we can get nanograms per day of mercury. And then we can back calculate what their nanograms per day of mercury would have to be to explain their hair mercury levels. And using those two things, we could evaluate the performance of the baseline exposure model. <clears throat> so this does that. Um, so are the, these are two seasons. This is the fuller scale fall season. Uh, modeled hair on the x-axis. This is what we would think their hair mercury should be based on their self-reported fish consumption. And the measured hair mercury is what it actually is, according to the instrument. Um, and so because there are many parameters that mediate the relationship between ingested mercury and the mercury that's in my hair, um, how much partitions to blood and all these other factors. Actually, we don't know. We don't have one single value for what their modeled hair mercury would be for a given consumption. All we have is a range. 
So these points are actually ranges. And the green, line, the green dots represent ranges. So the dots correspond to the midpoint of the range. That is not shown here. Um, and the green dots correspond to modeled hair mercury that is within the, uh, sorry, measured hair mercury that is in, within the range of the modeled forecast. So if it's green, it means, well, their hair mercury level is consistent with what we would calculate from their reported fish consumption. And across three orders of magnitude, 75% um, in the fall round um, were consistent, meaning we don't need to invoke uh, biases related to the survey to um, explain departures from the line. So there is scatter, right? <clears throat> and there is even some scatter outside of the green zone. So for instance, this guy, like, who knows why his hair mercury was not consistent with his uh, self-reported diet. He likely over-reported certain fish that were high in mercury. Um, and then under-reports is the same thing, but the opposite. And so even though there is that scatter, um, there's very little bias, meaning the mean measured to modeled ratio is very close to one. So with this, we are thinking that this model actually performs quite well. Can I ask a question? Yes. So to make the assumption here that the only source of mercury is in the fish? Yes. Can you really rule out mercury from other sources? In the hair, yes. So um, some people who do blood mercury analysis control for dental fillings because you can see some mercury in the blood um, that correlates to the number of fillings you have. But for the hair, most studies, and all the studies that I've seen actually recently, have found that there's no correlation between hair mercury and fillings. And dietary-wise, like 99% of all the mercury people consume is from fish because it is accumulated through the aquatic food chain. Um, there are some exceptions. So I mentioned fish. Birds that eat fish can also be high in mercury. Um, and so we obviously ask people for their consumption of seabirds and stuff. Um, so yeah, we controlled for like really 100% of anything that they could conceivably have ingested mercury through. Um, and we didn't, um, we didn't ask about fillings because that isn't enough to bias the hair sample. So that's my, OK. But yes, good observation. Uh, OK, and this is just a box plot of the absolute hair mercury levels in the population. Um, this is everyone in our study, and these are the three communities that we sampled. So Rigolette, I'm gonna, it's going to come up again. Rigolette is the most remote community. Um, and it doesn't even have road access. So they live a much more traditional lifestyle. They eat more from the local environment. And then so they have high mercury levels. In general, the message here is that um, the distribution is higher than the general population. The EPA recommended like safe level for hair mercury is about 1 ppm. So still, most people are um, under the uh, recommended level. There is a long tail, right? Uh, it goes to about 6 point something ppm. Um, that's enough to be in the so-called danger zone for prenatal impacts. But uh, it's still outside of, it's below um, the level of onset of like acute symptoms. So you would expect to see like tremor, tingling, um, maybe difficulty concentrating as of like 20 to 100 ppm, depending on the person. OK, so baseline stuff. Now, this is where it gets a little more interesting. So when we plug our uh, future forecast of methylmercury levels in the water column, uh, and we weight that by the habitat preferences of all of the key species that people um, get mercury from, we can see how those levels change. So in this, so this is a bar plot of mercury concentrations. Gray is measured baseline. Uh, blue is projected future with pretty wide error bars because we have a pretty big distribution of future states. Um, Store-bought foods obviously do not increase at all. Um, so fish sticks, after project development, the level of mercury in the fish sticks is going to be the same. Uh, 
species that spend all of their time in the river uh, increase the most drastically. Um, and then the more time they spend in the estuary and out to sea, um, the lower the impacts are. And this is just a representation of how overall mercury impacts change. So across the population, overall exposure is about double. And the relative contribution of local sources goes from 70% about, from to about 90%. So at baseline, um, we think across the population, 70% of all exposures are from local sources. Um, and that increases to 90% after, after flooding. And the other 30% would be from store-bought seafood. So this graph shows <coughs> um, Rigolette, which, like I said, is the most traditional population. Um, and it also, it's Rigolette, women of childbearing age and children. So the most sensitive subpopulation um, in the most uh, at-risk community. And this is mercury levels, mercury exposures at baseline compared to uh, US and Canada reference doses. And so for this subpopulation, like at baseline, um, it's pretty much fine. Um, certainly population-wide, on average, people respect the reference dose. Even at the, even at the uh, up to the 95th percentile, they still respect the Health Canada reference dose. Um, it's really a very small subset of the population that even approaches or exceeds those doses, which are, um, are intended to be conservative. So what happens when we flip the switch for development? Again, this corresponds to expected post-flooding future levels of methylmercury. Well, across the population, it about doubles, which is what we saw um, in the previous slide. They still respect the Health Canada reference dose. And here, error bars correspond to the uh, 90th percentile um, of, uh, of distribution of values. So population-wide, it's still pretty much fine. Um, as you get higher and higher into the, uh, you, get, you climb the percentile rank of exposures, the uh, impacts get more and more severe. And by the time you're at the 95th or higher percentile, you're in the zone post-flooding of where people might actually be experiencing acute effects. So beyond the level of like, subclinical chronic risks, um, and this raises an important point about how risk assessments are done. It's a little tangential, but I'll bring it up anyway. Is uh, often uh, risk analyses look at population means and how population-wide exposures or average exposures would respond to certain environmental scenarios. Um, but if you do that, you're missing all of the things you care about. So you really have to look at the distribution of impacts. Um, and this goes for methylmercury impacts. Uh, in this case, but I think it's a generalizable point that you, it's really essential to look at the distribution of, uh, of values. And that's not often done because a lot of environmental assessments um, have small populations. And also, it's often not advantageous to the proponents of projects to look at the distribution of exposures. So there are a lot of things that collide um, in order to obfuscate that technical point. OK, so remember a few slides ago that I, my overall interest in this work was to develop screening tools to uh, guide um, hydro development in, in general. And so as a first step to that, I inventoried all of the hydro dams um, in either in development or have been proposed across Canada. So this is our site up here with Lescrat Falls. Gull Island is another. Um, supposed to be another phase of this project, but it's been plagued by so many problems. Um, methylmercury and otherwise, I really doubt that Gull Island is ever going to happen. Um, so we started up there. This is an inventory of the other hydro projects across Canada, where the red circles correspond to um, predicted post-flooding maximum water column methylmercury levels by adapting uh, the tool that we developed for Muskrat Falls to these other sites using publicly available data. So soil carbon, which is the background on this map, um, is one parameter. It doesn't necessarily correlate to the intensity of the red dots, because there are other parameters, like um, discharge of the river flooded area. Um, so the 
more discharge and the lower flooded area, um, the lower the impacts would be for a given carbon level, according to our model. And so I also co-located co on this map um, indigenous populations across Canada just to see like what the future of this issue is. And 90% of the capacity, so if you look at the megawatts represented by each of these dots, 90% of the capacity uh, of short-term future sites are located within uh, 100 kilometers of indigenous population centers. So this shows that this problem is not going away. Um, and approach, you know, approaches to proactively um, anticipate risk like this are probably going to be more important going forward. So this has, uh, this is interesting to me because even though hydro is almost 60% of all installed capacity in Canada, corresponds to about 78 gigawatts of installed capacity. If we tally everything up on this map, that's about maybe 10% more. That still leaves, oh, did I lose my box? OK, I'm supposed to show that this is going to be two thirds undeveloped. There's you know, 300 or so uh, gigawatts still untapped, uh, even if we fully develop the previous map. So there's enormous scope, uh, I think, to uh, choose where we develop. And I think as a part of that, we need to use environmental and health impacts um, as a screening criterion. And to do that, we need to enhance our modeling capacity in that area. And so, yes, it's relevant for Canada. Um, it is also relevant to the US, I would argue, because in certain northern US markets, um, Canadian hydro accounts for a huge chunk of um, the electricity sold on local markets. So in the entire northeast US, it's 16%. In you know, northern New Hampshire, obviously, it's higher. Um, so you could argue that you, know, you have a responsibility to um, be aware of these impacts that are uh, associated with the energy that are being imported, is being imported. Um, but also the Conservation Law Foundation in Concord uh, down the road is arguing to the DOE um, through legal maneuvers that um, the DOE actually has to consider the environmental impacts associated with um, energy that it imports, even if those impacts happen outside the US. So that's my special pitch to the American audience. <laughs> oh, there's my, OK, that's what I wanted to show. OK, so uh, my main messages for that chunk of the work is that hydropower development can have significant impacts on methylmercury exposures that we measured for the first time in this work. Um, those impacts are highly unevenly distributed, which is like most things. Um, and we can develop tools for those risks to forecast those impacts. Um, and that can uh, come into play in design decisions um, and in site selection. So all of that work, OK, so this is sort of my mental model of that work, is that it connects hydropower development through a mechanistic pathway um, to impacts on aquatic methylmercury, to fish methylmercury. There's no difference here. This would be fish MEHG. Um, it characterizes those risks on human exposures. And then it uses those exposures to guide upstream decisions. OK, simple enough. I'm interested also in the social aspect. So how do increases in fish mercury cause changes to fish intake? So I said at the beginning that one of the main policy responses to this issue was to um, issue food advisories. If the fish mercury goes up, eat less fish. OK, well, if people are eating less fish, that changes mercury exposures or prevents them from going up, at least. But it also has other changes. It other, also invokes other changes, like they're probably eating more of something else to make up for the lost fish. But then the overall health risks really depend on uh, not just their methylmercury exposures, but also what it is they're eating to replace the lost fish. And that all combines, that all combines together to determine health impacts. Um, you can't separate one from the other. And so I'm interested in studying also that part of the causal map to figure out 
what the health impacts are of this whole system um, and to use that to guide upstream hydropower development or public health advice. So that's going to be the last technical part of this talk um, with the time we have left. So uh, the most concerning part, in my opinion, of impacts on indigenous food systems is that store-bought foods in remote areas are extremely expensive. So this is like $90 steak and $30 grapes. Um, and this is, these are in areas with a very low prevalence of wage labor. So dietary alternatives are not really that easily available. And so you have, but the mentality is so widespread. Like this is a member of parliament um, tweeting about Muskrat Falls. He's like, well, if you're worried about mercury, just eat less fish. What's the big deal? And so this is exactly the kind of retrograde way of doing things that I was kind of problematizing in my first few slides. So this kind of speaks to, you know, beyond this, there is um, sort of a disciplinary tension in the sense that environmental scientists are very worried about the impacts on human health of uh, environmental contaminants. So they tend to focus on advice related to minimizing exposures to that. Meanwhile, nutritionists and public health people recognize that, well, you can't just not eat food, so you have to eat something. And like, maybe it's, maybe it's not health protective to say you shouldn't eat this comparatively nutritious source of food. Like, what is the overall risk of these contaminants in comparison to what the alternatives are? Like, are they really eating you know, $30 grapes, or are they eating Doritos? Like, it probably makes a difference. Um, so I wanted to, I guess my goal for this part of the work was to reconcile those competing narratives. So I structured it in kind of a decision analytic way. Um, and I looked at, I started with the uh, output of my analysis from the last section. So I accept that mercury levels in local foods are going to increase. And then I considered that people have two choices. They can make no changes to their diet, which is the decision kind of implicit in the last analysis, which is people's mercury exposures just increase. They you know, continue on their current diet, and um, they face increased mercury levels uh, accordingly. Or they make decisions, perhaps in response to food consumption advisories, perhaps because they lose faith in local food systems. And they substitute local foods for alternatives. So for this, I considered several sub-scenarios to kind of bound the risks. Um, these are not intended to be uh, uh, exhaustive possibilities of what people could choose. They're intended to represent the range of possible risks that any decision would fall in between. So on the one extreme, um, everyone could uh, stop eating local salmon because they're afraid of mercury and eat bacon instead. And especially for cardiovascular endpoints, that you know, eating processed meat is a disastrous choice to protect yourself from cardiovascular risks. So that's one extreme. Or maybe they would eat vegetables, or maybe they would eat um, things that are not particularly harmful per se, um, but displace better sources of uh, calories. So, you know, empty calorie chips that are high in, um, you know, fatty acids and salt and things that are ha that themselves have health risks but uh, do not carry intrinsic um, uh, risks. Or maybe they eat a representative basket of what I'm calling nutritious foods. So, um, in these remote communities, we have a good sense of all of the tr nutritious foods that people eat because the government pays a subsidy to stores to stock a wide range of nutritious foods. So we know on a per capita basis what everyone is eating from this very long list of so-called nutritious foods. So OK, what if people replace the, the lost calories with those instead? Um, and then I compare those scenarios with a database of confounder-adjusted dose-response relationships on a suite of endpoints. So I picked 
cancer and cardiovascular, those are the two most commonly um, studied, um, and also neurodevelopmental because of the countervailing risk with mercury. So comparing that on the one hand to what are the neurological and cardiovascular risks of increased methylmercury exposures, and that this is the risk that people would be avoiding if they lost faith in their local food system or were told not to eat the fish for fear of these impacts. Um, there's no cancer uh, risk associated with methylmercury, so the cancer risk only applies to the store-bought substitution. <clears throat> so uh, this is a bar graph of calories by source for everyone, then men, then uh, women. And local foods, local traditional foods, only account for like 5% of overall calories consumed across the population. The next biggest chunk is these nutritious store-bought foods that are subsidized by the government. And then everything else is uh, junk food. And we know this because we can back calculate with people's uh, reported height, sex, and weight um, what their calorie intake should be in order to sustain those dimensions. Um, and then we can piece in everything together. We know all of the local foods and store-bought seafoods they eat from, their local, from the local survey that we did. Um, and we know this from government records. So this, I think this observation that local people eat, you know, a relatively small fraction of their diet comes from local sources has enabled this mindset of like, well, who cares if, you know, it increases in mercury, just don't eat it. But if you cross-reference this with nutritional databases, um, you see that, okay, it accounts for like 5% of calories, but a hugely disproportionate amount of a long list of nutrients. So D DHA and EPA are two key um, omega-3 fatty acids that virtually exclusively come from seafood, um, vitamin D, vitamin B12. It also accounts for a lot of mercury. This is the 70% figure from um, one of my first slides. Uh, and many of these are themselves associated with um, health endpoints that if you lost access, if you reduced your consumption of omega-3 fatty acids, for instance, there's very strong epidemiological evidence to believe that uh, you would face increased cardiovascular risks um, and neurodevelopmental risks, even if you're not increasing the amount of mercury you consume. So these are the bar graphs for the three health endpoints um, I considered. And we can just zoom in on cardio for the sake of, the sake of argument. Um, this is population-wide mean risks um, for the different scenarios. This is population mean risk uh, for increased mercury consumption at baseline diet. So yes, increasing the amount of mercury in people's uh, traditional food system is bad. It will be associated with a neurological effect and a cardiovascular effect. That's bad. But what is probably worse is if you are if you try to avoid those risks by making decisions that produce bigger risks. So these are the four, uh, four store-bought uh, food replacement scenarios. And you can see that across the population, mean risks for these uh, four store-bought uh, foods are way higher than what you're probably going to get from methylmercury impacts. So what does this tell you? If you're afraid about if you're afraid about mercury, don't replace fish with bacon, right? You're better off probably just eating the fish. This green bar makes the hypothesis that, okay, you're a f conscious of the methylmercury problem, so instead of abandoning the local foods altogether, you instead make different local food choices, and you eat um, salmon instead, which is, uh, tends to be very low in methylmercury, um, even though it's a big fish, I guess because they don't live that long compared to other big fish? I don't actually don't know the mechanism. Do you know, Celia? We can talk about it later. Uh, huh? It's how fast they grow? Yeah, so salmon are surprisingly low in mercury. Um, so even accounting for the fact that there's some risk that salmon will increase in methylmercury after development, um, if you double down on that local food choice or other uh, foods that are low in mercury, you can probably not just avoid risks, but you know, improve your health outcomes relative to today, even in the world of having increased methylmercury levels. 
So my main overall message there um, is that traditional foods are important for indigenous health, even if they're a small fraction of the overall calories, um, and that risk mitigation measures might actually increase your risks uh, if you don't look at them in a sort of systems way, um, and that this kind of finding only really emerges from studying everything within a unified modeling environment. Um, and too often we're sort of s separated into disciplines and we don't see the full picture emerging um, in our silos until we put everything together. And so I'm going to, we're at about, is that 425? So I guess we can wrap it up with a Q&A. I think I was, I'm already five minutes over actually. So let's end there and open it up to, oh, well, I can't conclude without thanking um, Elsie Sunderland at Harvard, who was my PhD advisor and under whose supervision I carried this work out. She runs the Biogeochemistry of Global Contaminants Lab at Harvard um, and is at School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and the School of Public Health. Our generous funders, and of course, um, we work very closely with the indigenous government um, in Labrador that uh, was really active in facilitating our health study. So it's very important to, to do this kind of work. You really need to have local people involved. Um, and not just you know willing to go along with it, but like act actively involved in the research um, agenda and helping you do it. Otherwise, it's never going to get done. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yep. I have a question about carbon. So you said that the amount of production of methyl mercury after reservoir has been founded is to do additional uh, organic carbon. So what are the mechanisms that liberate organic carbon to get it going at are there uh, mitigation strategies so we can avoid or limit uh, organic carbon to begin with? So there, uh, for mitigation strategies, there are a few technical ones. Are you talking about technological interventions? Right, like maybe preventing um, or something like that. Oh, so actually, the, after this work came out, the government of Newfoundland uh, convened an independent advisory panel to examine the potential benefits to human health of removing certain soil deposits. So like, if they spend however much money um, excavating these parts of the uh, future reservoir, what would that change for likely future methylmercury production? And then how would that change potential human exposures when they use this model? Um, and they, their scenarios were not particularly aggressive, so they didn't find that it had a big effect, but that's just because they targeted areas that didn't account for a lot of the global carbon in the system. Um, in my sort of uh, relatively abstracted approach, I'm just considering a linear relationship, so the more carbon you remove, the less... Uh, overall methylmercury you would produce. So what I'm saying, there may be techniques to change that slope. Oh, I see. Uh, well, there are environments... There are environments that where carbon is not the limiting factor. So in, I think wetlands are thought to be sulfate limited, um, but they tend to have higher carbon as a baseline. Um, there are a lot of very low carbon or carbon poor environments uh, that... So if you go back to my map of Canada. We are actually in like an unusually red zone at Muskrat Falls, which is one of the reasons, even though it's like a relatively low, it's a relatively small reservoir, the impacts were forecasted to be relatively large, but like huge swaths of the country um, are very carbon poor. And so I don't know, like, I would, I guess I would have to talk more to my biogeochemists about changing the slope of the line, but I would say that you could get to a different point on the line pretty easily through site, site screening. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question about the, that line. And, you know, one of the things when I talk to our Chinese colleagues, they say, oh, you know, we're citing all these dams, but our rivers are not really where there's going to be a lot of that, which suggests they're fast flowing, low carbon sites. So, like, if you, yeah, when you're down in this... So these green, these green dots came from China. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So in a sense, then, uh, to do the estimate using, you know, equivalent kind of data, I wondered if you cite it in a place like that, and then you do the estimate of how much it increases. Yeah, so... so before and after. 
Uh, what do you mean before and after? Uh, before and after sighting, right? If you did the. If you oh, did, I see. Oh, so like you pick a region and then you pick, then you do your regression kind of thing, or? Well, if if you had if you had done this same study that you did at Muscat Falls and mm -hmm. one of the Chinese areas where there's low carbon. Oh yeah. How well, much would it inc like you you were talking about an increase of more you know doubling? Right? Yeah, that's that's. Uh, so the river methylmercury, we thought at steady state, um, it would be a tenfold increase in the river water column, and then a twofold increase downstream in the estuary. Um, and so I actually don't know like how, like the covariance between carbon is that maybe that's what you're asking the covariance between carbon and other parameters that impact the system. Yeah, I guess that's. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question, but it would be interesting. It would be interesting to make a map of like how those. Like how all the relevant parameters vary, to see like if there's an optimal region. And then it becomes like an optimal carbon setting. Yeah, there's optimal carbon setting. Yeah, and you want fast rivers um, to dilute. Yeah, um, and then but so, I I think another aspect of your question is that uh, that this sort of methylmercury versus carbon relationship applies within these. Dots. So these are site-wide averages. So for these three blue sites, we only had site-wide averages. For the solid dots, um, these are whole like universes of data, and mm -hmm. the there's a a similar slope within the sites. Yeah. Okay, right. yeah. But the downside, it, you know, it's more data points, but the range is much smaller yeah. in each of them. So yeah, so that's why we did this approach. But it was supported by like the thousands of data points within each blob. I'm here all day, so. Yeah, perfect. So, uh...